Now I would like to warmly welcome Daniel Lord, the founder and director of OmniTouch International. For over 20 years, Daniel has helped and inspired people through training in customer experience, customer service, and contact center management. Today, he will be sharing with us, with us some valuable learnings from his favorite old classic, The Wizard of Oz. Welcome, Daniel. Hey, thank you very much, Chris. It's lovely to be here. It's our pleasure, Daniel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. We're ready. So we'll open our presentation here. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for the lovely introduction. In our session today, I'd like to share some CX lessons that we can learn from the classic 1939 film, The Wizard of Oz, from both behind the scenes as well as from the characters that are portrayed in the movie. So let's move forward here. There we go. So according to the U.S. Library of Congress, The Wizard of Oz is the most seen film in movie history. It's a recognized masterpiece. But creating a masterpiece for an audience isn't actually that easy. If it were, then every movie would be a masterpiece. So let's take a look at some of what went into the making of The Wizard of Oz. At the 1940 Academy Awards, the song Somewhere Over the Rainbow won Song of the Year. And the American Film Institute describes this as the best movie song ever. And when we listen to Judy Garland sing this song in the movie, it's definitely a highlight of the movie. In CX terms, I'd actually call it a moment of truth because it has very deep emotional resonance. Now, a lot of people don't know that the MGM studio executives originally cut the song somewhere over the rainbow out of the movie. Why did they do that? Because they felt that no MGM star, in this case, Judy Garland, should be filmed singing in a barnyard. It just didn't fit the glamorous image of MGM Studios. Now, fortunately for us and for movie history, one of the producers basically put up a fight and he said, look, the song stays or I go. And he actually won, if you want to call it a fight, and they put the song back in the movie. So what is the lesson for us CX professionals out there? Here's what I think it is. Our CX life is better when the opinions held by our senior management are grounded in voice of customer and voice of employee data. Because opinions that are not grounded in data are exactly that, just opinions. And frankly, those opinions are not always very helpful to our CX ambitions. I very much like the term cultural belief. Uh, a cultural belief is a nice way to describe important opinions. In this case, those held by senior management because it's the cultural beliefs held by senior management that really drive the culture of the company. And let me walk you through three cultural beliefs that we've experienced in our work with clients around the world. Employees are mostly motivated by money. People who work from home are not as productive as people who work in an office. Um, we're a global organization with many countries, so we need a very strict rule book in place to ensure that everybody has compliance. Can you see how every single one of these beliefs is going to dramatically impact what it's like to work there, what it's like to work in that particular company? And notice I'm not saying the beliefs are good or bad. I'm not judging the beliefs. I'm just very keen to know what was the reasoning behind the conclusions that we see here. And I'm also very keen to know what was the data used to reach these conclusions here. Every single organization has cultural beliefs at work. For example, those MGM studio executives, they truly believe an MGM star should not be filmed singing in a barnyard. So the topic that we're in is culture. And what you're looking at here is my favorite definition of culture. Will you take a moment to read it for yourself? Let me tell you why I like this definition so much, because it incorporates the idea that people want to succeed where they work. So what they do is they lean into these shared assumptions and they think about how to react so that they can succeed. So let me give some examples. Do I work on ways to engage my employees over and above money? Well, if my bosses think that money is what motivates employees, why would I waste my time doing that? They're not going to buy into it. 
Or mm, do I put forward a work from, from home strategy? Well, if my bosses think people that work from home are not as productive as people that work in an office, I'm probably wasting everybody's time. It's not going to get improved, uh, approved. Um, do I allow the local market countries to have some level of variation in performance, or do I just stick with a very rules-based rule book that my company has? These are important things to be aware of. Um, we CX people basically drive the attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors about customers across the entire organization. So we need to do, I call it a cultural belief audit. We have to identify what the cultural beliefs are where we work. Because frankly, some of these beliefs will be very helpful to you as you're rolling out your CX work. And other beliefs are gonna act as a barrier to you and make it very difficult for you to achieve what you want to achieve. Let me give you a scenario to identify what the cultural beliefs are where you work. Let me describe it. Imagine a new hire joins your company and they come into the office and seated in the cubicle next to them is a long-term employee. So the long-term employee leans over and says, hey, welcome to our company. Really glad to see you here. You know what? Can I give you some tips on what it's going to take to su uh, survive around here? Can I give you some tips on what it takes to succeed around here? Now, whatever comes out of the mouth of that long-term employee, well, welcome to cultural beliefs because they're sharing those shared assumptions. And I think that's the first lesson that I picked up from the movie, The Wizard of Oz. Let's carry on if, we, if you're okay with that. Here's another behind the scenes story from The Wizard of Oz. It took 10 screenwriters to turn the novel by Elfrin Baum into the movie we know today. And that's an awful lot of screenwriters. It, theoretically, writing by committee isn't supposed to work. But in the case of The Wizard of Oz, it really did. And film historians, who are the people that study this kind of thing, they actually read every single script of The Wizard of Oz. And here's what they concluded. As the rewrites carried on, the quality of the story got better and better and better to the movie that we know today. So here's the CX lesson we can learn from all the screenwriters that contributed to the script for The Wizard of Oz. CX is an iterative team sport. Now, iterative is the same word we use when we talk about experience design. And you see here in front of us, the experience design process. And basically with this process, we research, we analyze, ideate, prototype, and test. And we bounce back and forth, bounce back and forth, perhaps multiple times, until we come up with a final or right solution for our customer. So it's okay when you're on the far left at the beginning of the process with some original problem to not know what the final solution is going to look like, to not know what that answer is going to look like. That's the value of using an iterative process. And I also like to say that CX is a team sport. What do I mean by that? Well, we CX people use our empathy superpower to work with other people across the organization because our internal stakeholders, people like department heads, senior management, and other employees in the company, they deserve our empathy too. Empathy should not just be reserved for customers. So with that in mind, I actually have an idea or suggestion for you to better show your empathy to your colleagues, in this case, most especially these department heads. Let me share that lesson with you. When we're setting our CX metrics, we are looking to track the success of our CX initiatives. And we very often see these metrics take two basic levels. Level one metrics are the big ones. You can see them on the screen here, customer satisfaction, customer advocacy, customer lifetime value. They apply to the entire organization and they have been selected by the most senior people in the organization. So these senior people expect that over time, these metrics will improve or move in the right direction. Level two metrics are different. Level two metrics are the metrics we set at the departmental level. And they're meant to help us run our department well, as well as obviously support and align to or level up to the level one metrics. Um, and obviously they're gonna look very different from department to department. What I'm gonna look for in the marketing department is gonna look different than operations. 
The example I've used here is the contact center. And these are some of the metrics you might see in the contact center environment. First contact resolution, contact quality, and so on. Here's my question for you to think about. Which level of metrics do you think department heads care about more? If you had to choose between level one and level two, which one do you think they care about more? You don't have to type the answer, just come up with it for yourself. Okay, so here we go. Um, let's be really realistic about this. No smart department head is going to trash a level one metric. They're not going to say customer satisfaction doesn't matter. They're not going to say customer lifetime value doesn't matter. But when it comes down to it, their day-to-day -day lives are consumed with looking at their departmental performance. And they're probably very heavily measured on their departmental metrics. So now that I know this, here's what I can do. I can show empathy for my colleagues when I use what I know about customers in CX to help them improve their metrics and improve their outcomes not just run around and blah, blah, blah about survey scores and net promoter scores all day. Help them improve. Because when you look at it, when I help my department heads improve level two, that's going to automatically improve the level one metrics anyway. So I'm still achieving that great CX outcome. I do have to share a caveat here, a word of warning. This assumes that the metrics set at level two are in fact customer centric. Let me give a couple of examples. On the screen, you see first contact resolution. Well, first contact resolution is seen to be a customer-centric metric. Why so? Because it benefits the organization and it benefits the customer. Let me give you one that's not customer-centric. Unfortunately, and I have to put it that way, some contact centers still measure their agents on number of calls handled. But number of calls handled is not a customer-centric metric. Why? Because it emphasizes or weights cost efficiency for the benefit of the organization over serving the customer well. So it's good to be aware of level one and level two, but it's also good to be aware and do perhaps a bit of a metrics audit to see if the level two metrics are either helping the department run well or supporting level one. Cool guys, all right. Do you remember this scene? Um, Dorothy and Toto have landed in Munchkin land and then the Wicked Witch of the West appears because she wants to find out what happened to her sister, the Wicked Witch of the East. And of course, she wants to get her hands on those ruby slippers. After she threatens Dorothy and Toto, she basically whirls around in a big cyclone of flame and disappears. You probably remember this. Now, to make this dramatic effect work, Margaret Hamilton, the actor that played the Wicked Witch of the West, she had to position herself on top of a little trap door. And that trap door was designed to lower her below the stage before all the flames leapt up. But as she was descending, she caught on fire. She sustained second and third degree burns on her face and on her hands. And she was actually in recuperation for six weeks before she could come back and resume filming. Well, why didn't she sue the movie studio? She actually answered that question later in her life and she recorded an interview with, a, with someone on a talk show or TV show. And she basically told the interviewer, look, if I had sued MGM Studios, I would never have gotten another job in Hollywood. And she said, quite frankly, I really needed the money at the time. Of course, people work for money. They have lives and families to support. Margaret Hamilton needed the money she earned as an actor in the film, The Wizard of Oz, but she did not sign up to work in an unsafe environment. All righty. So what's the CX learning here? Well, you probably already figured out it has to do with taking better care of our employees because there are so many ways we can make our workplace safe or unsafe for employees. It's a huge topic. For, to, for today, I really just want to share on one unsafe work practice that we still see in our work around the world, and that's targeting employees, especially those working in customer service, on net promoter or customer satisfaction scores. That is an unsafe work practice. Here we go. Even the consultants that came up with net promoter score remind us 
The net promoter score was designed as a relationship metric, something that's measured over time. When you use net promoter, here's what you're saying. Dear customer, now that you've been with us for a while, or you've been through quite a few things with us, how likely would be, you be to recommend us? It is not saying, dear customer, today you had a call in the contact center. Yesterday you used our mobile app. Based on your transaction with our mobile app, how likely would you be to recommend us? That's considered to be an incorrect application of the metric. It's not designed to be transactional in nature. So be careful. Please don't mix up relationship and transaction metrics. A head of CX at a bank told me this story, which I love, and I'm going to share the story with you. He was hired into the bank to improve the net promoter scores of the contact center. So what he did is he studied the drivers of those scores. He looked at all the reasons customers were giving low scores for calls and emails and chats. And he ended up proving that more than 80% of the reason for the lower scores had to do with a product or process or activity from another department. It had nothing to do with the conduct center. So for example, the ATM machines didn't work. The credit cards were declined for no reason when people tried to use them. The paperwork to open a new account was overwhelming. So to sum it up, the net promoter score wasn't really a reflection of the individual that served that customer. It was being driven by other activities. Let me give you some advice. If you're after tr a transactional metric for your frontliners, why don't you do your customer research and all that cool regression stuff to identify what the drivers of overall satisfaction are with a transaction? Let me give an example. We had a client that did that research work, studied the regression, the correlation, and so on. And they identified that the behavior of patients was super important for their customers. Every time patients seemed to exist in that communication, the net promoter score, the customer satisfaction score was higher so they set a metric around patients because they knew an uptick in patients would translate into an uptick in net promoter score. And that's smart. All righty. Dorothy has one overriding objective after she landed in Oz. And in CX, we might call that her job to be done. Dorothy's job to be done is to meet the Wizard of Oz and to get his help to go home. And when you step back and think about it, the entire plot of the movie is very much about Dorothy's mental, emotional, and spiritual journey to go home. But we all know she didn't go on that journey alone. She met some very interesting characters along the way. First, she ran into the Scarecrow. Now, see if you can remember, what was it that the Scarecrow felt he lacked? Just take a moment. What was he after or hoping to get from the wizard? And if you said brains, you are right. He felt he lacked brains. But as we all know, by the end of the film, he turned out to be the smartest one of all. And then they ran into the Tin Man. And what did the Tin Man think he lacked? I'll give you a moment to reflect back. Well, that's right. The Tin Man felt he lacked a heart. But again, by the end of the movie, he's got the biggest heart of all of them. And then they meet the lion. And of course, we're aware that the lion felt that he didn't have courage. He felt he was a coward. But he and we, by the end of the movie, know that he was probably the bravest one of all. So as I come to the end of my talk with you today, here's what I think. To do what so many of you do every day to make people's lives better, you need brains, you need heart, and you need courage. And I wish you nothing but the very best on your CX journey. Thank you very much for spending time with me today. Thank you, Daniel. A truly creative and inspiring storytelling. <laughs> you are more than welcome. And I get to relive the movie, Krissa, which is always fun for me. Thank you so much, Daniel. So I saw some questions coming in the audience chat. So you can... Uh, you can just go there and talk to the audience and see their comments. Thank no you, Anne. Worries. Score. We'll look at them a bit. We'll look at them a bit later if that's okay, Anne, and then I'll do my that's, best to answer them after that. That's the, fine. No worries at all. The video. I appreciate the it. Though, will okay? be available for the next six days. 
<laughs> so no worries, you can visit the next six days and watch the videos and get again and uh, answer questions. That's brilliant. And I, I love questions and comments. I think that that's, that's superb and it shows that people are there even after the break, right? Yes, they are. Thank you so much once again. I, we need to move forward to our next speaker. Bye-bye, Daniel. Goodbye. Thank you.